Hello and welcome to another episode of Unsource Wall. My name is Elvis and as always, I am your host. All right, so there is actually going to be no what did I watch this week segment this week because there was no updates on anything. Apparently, it all decided to take a day off and stuff like Doom Patrol and other things don't premiere until next week. So it can be kind of lax there, but that doesn't mean we didn't get a whole swarm of new releases, questions and news topics. So let's start off right now with some movie news. First things first, we have the final confirmation that Kevin Feig will oversee an MCU reboot of the X-Men film franchise. First on their agenda is seeking out a new Wolverine, which is kind of funny because the prevailing call among fans is that they want the new one to finally be a short guy like Wolverine in the comics. So that has to be a blow to whoever they end up choosing, especially if it does turn out to be a short actor because that's all people will care about short. There are some calls for it to continue off from Logan in broad strokes and feature X-23 in the main role and I feel like that would be a good idea and I've mentioned this before but I feel like that's what they should have done with the new mutants as a springing off board rather than taking it out by the field and shooting it but the MCU will do what it will and hopefully they make some good choices. I'm kind of really disinterested in what they're going to do because for me the X-Men film franchise ended with Apocalypse and Deadpool 2 respectively so I I'm over it. Next up is the claim that Brian Michael Bendis is making that he is still working on an X-Men film of his own for Fox. While this is clearly thrown into question given the sale to Disney, the man has wormed his way into situations before, so I'd be on the lookout. Even though he is currently mucking around in the DCU, I would be wary that he somehow found a way to keep a claw in Marvel. He's just that kind of guy. Next up we have Another full clip from the upcoming Captain Marvel movie that was recently released. It's it's kind of dire, not only because of what it's about, but also compounded by how they decided to drop it at like 2 a.m. in the morning when no one was caring or awake. Given that it's a really stilted and boring fight scene from start to finish, that just seems like they're not having the most confidence in it. It's just shot and edited in the most passive and honestly blurring way when you would think that Carol finding a scroll disguised as some average smoke on top of a moving train would at least be portrayed and depicted in some kind of fun way but it just isn't it's just so flat and that really wasn't the only Captain Marvel stuff that really did not land or hit its mark this week. We also had the debut of the official Captain Marvel movie tie-in website, which is a website that is designed to look like a really early 90s geosites with flat, uninteresting backgrounds, comic sans up the wazoo, direct gray box links, and really bad clip art. The works. And that would be a cute idea if the rest of the marketing and advertising had any clue of what it wanted to be or had cohesive focus because since it doesn't have that this just feels and comes off as Another thing you're just throwing at the board, hoping that it lands. Because when you have character posters that are sci-fi and you have character posters that are like biker or sort of Suicide Squad-y, and then you have this heavily 90s throwback website, it just feels really random and scattered. And honestly, they don't know what to do. And so why would anyone else care about what this movie is or what it's trying to shoot for? It's just being so mishandled. But still, fingers crossed that this all turns out well. And in surprising news, apparently Rob Liefeld's Shrink, which if you don't remember, and I hope a lot of you do, was a series of gag comics he did about a psychiatrist who specialized in superheroes. And it was all very wacky, raunchy, and silly. And it was optioned years ago, but nothing ever came of it. Until the other day, Sony decided to put it back into pre-production. So yeah, the gag comic where an Ant-Man style character brags about his dick might come to the big screen. And that is just so... What a world, you know? Hopefully they get someone who can work with that and make it something really entertaining if it does happen and before we move on just when i thought there is nothing on the dc side to talk about apparently wb is doing some development on a spin-off to aquaman this spin-off will focus on the trench those piranha men that jeff johns introduced in a new 52 and that's about all we know and to me it just seems kind of pointless as a concept they're not that interesting and it just seems like an uphill battle for something that isn't really the sequel that apparently a lot of people really want and i can't 
can't see this going anywhere. Best of luck, seriously. Moving on to TV news, we're going to start off with probably the biggest news item this week, which is the announcement that the third season of Legion is going to be the last one, which isn't really a surprise, not only given how Disney buying Fox put all the X stuff into Jeopardy, but also because the trajectory of the show is already at the end of the line, which is great. It makes us feel like everything is coming with some sense of closure. And not only that, but the show has apparently cast its version of Professor X. While it's not, unfortunately enough, James McAvoy or Patrick Stewart, the role has gone to an actor called Harry Lloyd, who apparently played Viserys in Game of Thrones. According to Noah Hawley, the final season will explore the backstory of how Professor X defeated and killed the Shadow King, which seems like a lot of fun because the only time we ever saw that was in season one through David's imagination as a chalk drawing, and that was brilliant. So this seems like it could be really something entertaining, and I can't wait for it. I really can't. Next up in TV news is with DC stuff, which is that the star Girl show has cast some of its main villains, with actress Meg DeLacy being tapped to play Shiv, foe of Stargirl and daughter of the JSA villain Dragon King, who has also been cast. There's also another unrevealed character who has been cast with actor Jake Austin Walker. And this is the fun bit because apparently he's Ginger, and now we have so many people going out to guess that he's Wally West or something. But this is a JSA show, and so him and any other Ginger that appears is going to be my guess for Perdegaton because yeah no why wouldn't they set that up now next up for DC stuff is that we have the first and probably only actual teaser trailer for Doom Patrol it's barely 30 seconds or so and it's a montage of quick cuts about the team with some slight narration by Alan Tudyk as Mr. Nobody but in that small amount of time it's actually pretty encouraging the narration alone shows a nicely comedic and scathing bent with Tudyk bemoaning another TV show about superheroes while the rest gives off this feeling of something very poppy lively self-deprecating and overall just exuberant. Frazier's robot man whooping around some exasperating line readings and a good chunk of the dynamics. It really does feel like they have a clear vision of what they want the show to be or at least I hope they do. Titans while I liked it overall wafted a lot on that front and Doom Patrol for the sake of this service really has to make this an upward trend. I still can't wait though and fingers crossed and I can't wait to review that next week. Now for some short bits but we finally have our first pieces of casting news from new production Jupiter's Legacy Netflix show with Josh Duhamel being cast in the role of the Utopian, one of the forebears to the setting's current age of superheroes, Elena Camporis being cast in the role of Chloe Sampson, his daughter, and if you read the comics, the overall main character of the series. And we also have Leslie Bibb as Lady Liberty, Utopian's wife, Ben Daniels as Brainwave, his evil brother, Matt Lanter as Sky Fox, aka Hutch Sr., a renegade Batman type who has gone off the grid, and some other guys been cast as Brandon Sampson, aka Chloe's brother, Utopian's son, who has been manipulated and egged on to reneging against his father by Brainwave. So it's a whole big mess. One big thing that I feel they're excluding is Hutch Jr. who has a big role in the comics and it feels weird that they're calling this the main cast and he's not in it. Makes me really hope they're not doing this thing where they have Matt Lanter's Sky Fox take over his sort of job in the series because they've really skewed younger with the sort of older guard that they're playing with. Even though they're meant to be very long lived, they're all over a hundred in the comics but they still look rather old. They look like in their 70s or something. So it's still give and take and I really hope that they don't like with most Millar comics turned into adaptations that they get rid of the stuff that worked because they don't want to have any of it just like Kingsman did and lastly we have the first look at the Why the Last Man on Earth show, which has been picked up for a full series order. And the released promo image is that of a cloaked figure walking through an abandoned street at night with what looks to be corpses strewn about. And that looks like it could be fun. So yeah, fingers crossed for that as well. Let's move on into comic news. And let's start off with some of the good news first, which is that the Boondocks is back. Aaron McGrudder has returned with a series of news strips by one of the artists who worked on the show. And well, I honestly couldn't be happier. I actually loved this comic strip when I was a kid. I would pick up newspapers expressly for it and would borrow the collections from my library whenever I had the chance. It was wonderful and it kind of broke my heart when it was ended out of the blue right when the show began to take priority. So yeah, just all around great news and it hasn't missed a beat. The weird thing is that for now, the comic is only available through Charlemagne the God's Instagram page of about six installments so far. I'll post a link below. It's well worth 
surf it and I hope it continues. And the second big comic news story is a bit of a hard one to parse down. But let me try and see if I can. It seems that, well, Comics was back at it with a really inane sequence of events that was full of more twists and turns than I have ever seen. Apparently Mike S. Miller, who is doing a standard CG-oriented book called Lone Star, came into possession of a cover breakdown from deceased artist Mike Waringo, which he disregarded as being inherently worthless. On a stream of his, he laid out plans to draw over the breakdown and retrofit it as a cover for Lone Star, something that surprisingly gave a few of his followers and colleagues some pause and one even said that he should just use a light table and trace the base elements that he needed to a fresh copy but he said no later when all was said and done he went through with it and showed evs and other of his colleagues the final product if you can find a video clip it should be available on twitter the audible pause of shock they all make is wonderful it's really hilarious they even outright say that he shall have left it alone anyway to get to the meat of this he posts the picture on twitter claiming that it was to be the final ringo cover ever despite that being a lie he also claims that the breakdown was an unfinished cover and he did it a service by finishing it also a lie it was actually a prototype for an eventually finished cover. What was interesting is seeing the backlash, not only from regular folks, but also a few CGers on it. It is almost kind of neat to see that some still have a tiny speck of sense. In the end, the reaction was so volatile with other comic luminaries and even Waringo's estate head and brother coming out against him and, and really having at him that Miller decided to make a giant spectacle and show of burning the cover live on his stream and pledging his word to Ringo, his brother, on his honor that that was the end of it. A few hours later, it turned out that he only burned a copy. He still has the original and many more copies. And this is where that speck of astonishment that some see CGers had sense was flicked away again as a lot of CGers found this to be an amazing prank and cheered him on every step of the way. But then again, I have to keep reminding myself that these are the same people who paid $8 for hardcovers collecting four or so issues that may never happen. So they're already off the deep end. But it doesn't really stop there. No, it just gets worse and then it gets creepy because Miller, basking in the success of his glorious prank, decides to then announce his plan of buying all the cheap Orango original art that he can, still calling them worthless all the way, and then auctioning them off by himself, along with his Lone Star cover, which, as it turns out, might actually just be something he traced over the base elements of. So the original cover art might still exist. Who knows? He's playing coy, but regardless, if you break it down, all this means that he is planning to make real money off of these things, and he is sure he will, but it'll only actually be in service to his ego because he keeps repeating that the art isn't worth anything. So to him, the power of making money comes directly from himself. So buying all of this deceased man's art is just a way to prove that, and it's extremely weird and awful to go to such lengths just to show that you have the one up on a dead man, because that's what it boils down to. And wow, Jesus Christ, Comic Skate never fails to the press. Oh yeah, and something happened the other night. Apparently, he got into it with Dave Johnson and Dave Johnson drew Lone Star as a giant dick. But I think it's fine to leave off there. And that's it for comic news. Let's get into what I read this week. Starting right off with the Wrong Earth number six, which is the final issue of the first arc. It's perhaps not the best ending I feel they could have landed, but it is one that still packs a hell of a punch. And I overall had a great time with the series so far. The issue does almost lose me at points. But early on, when it seems to jump over what was a great beat and possible character branch, like almost completely ignores it, the rest of the issue goes in such a just as good direction that I felt that it wasn't really a missed opportunity because other developments came from such an assured and certain hand that it was so easy to get swept back into it. Perhaps my favorite bit of this issue is that after all the time spent showing how different they are, this seemingly goes out of its way to display how the two versions of the dragonfly are still kind of same. It's that root core of alternate dimension stories that I love and this issue uses parallel scenes and motivations to really make it work. And in showing the similarity, it only highlights their visceral differences to an almost creepy extent. It's actually pretty brilliant and sets up this eerie tinge to the darker universe dragonfly than was ever really shown before. In previous issues, he seemed to have been more reactive and more of a survivalist, 
And in this, it turns out that he's actually much more outright psychotic. And that leaves me excited for the next arc. But what gets the most anticipation from me is how it's still unraveling the greater scale of threat, which was hinted in the last page of the previous issue. And it continues to this last page with hints to the Joker analog series of this comic called Number One, both of whose originals, Darker and Lighter, have died. But it turns out that there is a third counterpart who is seemingly manipulating everything for extremely petty reasons. And that is fantastic and I love it. Apparently the second arc won't start until 2020 and I hope I'm still around by then. I can't wait for it. Apparently it's gonna have like an interlude issue for new comic book day. So yeah, gonna pick that up when it drops. Two thumbs up. Next up, we have a few issues that I had mixed feelings on. First, let's start off with one that got the better of me in The Green Lantern number 4. What I mean by got the better of me is that when I was originally reading it, I felt like this review was going to be something where I said I liked aspects of it. Because for the most part, that would have been true. This issue is structured through a framing device of two aliens sharing stories of mayhem and chaos. And it leading to Hal both fighting a Sun Eater and facing the consequences of his executing a man at the end of the previous issue. You. All of which works, and it would have been great had it not been for the somewhat awkward intrusion of the framing device into the main story again and again. Like in a Princess Bride sort of way, but not nearly as charming as a diversion. So for the time I spent reading most of it, it was a bit of a double-edged sword. The main content is incredibly well done, and I love how Hal and the JLC handled the situation and the mood and attitude Hal has to contend with throughout when he's called upon by the tribunal for his punishment. It's stellar. But yeah, I wasn't that much of a fan of the framing device, despite the prologue being an immaculately creepy story and very well placed. Then, in the last few pages, everything kind of twists. In a move I actually didn't see coming, turns out one of the aliens is Hal, and this had all been some sort of ploy, and it got me, it really did. Maybe some people saw it coming, but I didn't. Maybe that's just on me. But on rereading, the framing device did have a lot of really well deft subtle hints. Still a bit intrusive, but I see what they were getting at. Overall, it's a pretty entertaining issue for the most part, despite my other feelings for it. Can't wait for the next one because I really love how how they're pushing forward and building up Hal in these different directions. One thumb up, one thumb middle. Moving along to one of the patchiest I've read this week, and only by virtue of how good it otherwise is, we have the Immortal Hulk number 13. And I have to say, I both love and kind of really dislike this issue. And not just this issue, but this whole Hulk in Hell arc and direction the series has taken as a whole lately. Now, I know I've mentioned my complaints about where I feel like the series is taking a downturn with each new issue, but I feel like nothing more exemplifies it than this one. It's got some of the highest highs of any Hulk run I've read and a few of my favorite moments without a doubt but it's still dragged down by qualities that I feel have been lowering the standard of this arc for a while now. The incessant and mishandled theological and philosophical lectures jutting awkwardly into and out of the main story continues to be a chore. Pulling focus away from the actually engaging plot beats at best or feeling completely detached at worst. And yes, since I've been accused of this already, I get that it's meant to be an allegory for the one below all and meant to put it into context. But it's rather weird that rather than outright doing that, which would be interesting because you'd be learning about an entirely new theology of the comic, it more comes off as a forced lesson about Clip-Off and Golchab and Kabbalah. I feel like the only time this really worked in this arc was the very beginning, with that sequence talking about what hell means and how it feels. And that was honestly wonderful because the broad idea that the story can convey within itself. This is decidedly not that and is tiresome. That said, despite all that, this issue had some perfect moments. We have Rick Jones affirming his bond and loyalty to Bruce from beyond the grave. Bruce pretty much shazamming his strength back into the Hulk. And this wonderful page of the two of them realizing the depth of what they mean to each other. I mean, Bruce and Hulk, I mean. Maybe they'll do something with Rick later on, but he's still dead for now. It was pretty satisfying in regards to the character arcs it touched upon. I just wish it was tighter and more in tune with them overall. So one thumb up, one thumb down. The next issue is the Betty issue I've been waiting for and I really just cannot wait for that to hopefully be good and hopefully return to form in terms of structure and fingers crossed that the series will finally find its feet again. Next up, we have maybe the worst read of the week and that more or less means it's going to be easiest to talk about because it's so definitively awful in the clearest ways and that would be female furies number one and I just want to state it out right now, I did give this an open-minded chance and even with that, 
it was still just a terrible comic. To give a short statement on it, it's like this. As a fourth world fan, there are some obvious things I dislike about it, but taken away from all that, it's just so badly written with huge tonal problems that work against it and end up ruining all the themes it wants to use. In the end, coming off extremely incompetent. There are ways this could have been done better, but it lacks any of the tact. You have characters being stripped of interesting characteristics and others having incredibly blunt ones stapled on, making everything entirely less engaging in order for this to work. And it still pulls at the seams and overall falls apart under its own weight. It doesn't seem to have any idea what it wanted to do and it feels like the writer simply had a checklist of ideas and threw them all around and jammed them all in without rhyme or reason or taking the time to craft a unique take on this mythos that would sustain anything. So we get contradictory dialogue, serious and dramatic scenes, and wacky and goofy satire balancing back and forth against each other awkwardly. Not to mention adding on to the fact that the previously mentioned mishandling in the fourth world in general and it's an exorbitantly horrible read. It's just plain and simple bad. The art is okay but that's not enough to justify any of it. The threads of the plot that's building up don't inspire any confidence and the writer's recent stated intention of there being a reason Big Barter defected seems to have actually been literal and is now tied to a story that strips it of anything concerning character depth. Now it seems to boil down to did a bad thing now has to escape which is lame. There are so many specific things I can point out to from this issue but what would be the point? Yes Darkseid sexually coerces Granny Goodness into having sex with him. Yes there are repeated mentions of how easy the soldier boys have it despite them being turned to mindless drones. Yes after the rape scene there is a bake off and smile contest that feels like it's out of a slapstick comic. It just amounts to the same thing. This is a bad comic and I am done with it. After Mr. Miracle I don't have the time for more bad new god stories i wash my hands clear of it once again i want to bring up the interview that they put out which is that apparently they felt like all these things were self-evident in kirby's own works and nothing in this issue makes any more sense of that in fact it makes the interview make negative sense because this series is clearly working with the old kirby stuff it has definite ties to it but it mishandles and seems to misconstrue so many things from it that i have to wonder what castellucci was reading it feels Feels like this is a series based solely off of secondhand knowledge and it's really disheartening and you're playing with a mythos in such a definite time period of its history those are some things you should probably get right it's too much of a departure for something that is clearly wanting to be so tethered and hewed alongside with it it's it's honestly baffling in so many ways so two thumbs down. And penultimately we have Young Justice number two which honestly wasn't as bad as the first issue. I'll keep it short because that's all I can say about this one. That it wasn't as bad. The first was this cluttered and almost unreadable mess. This on the other hand is just some bookends around an extended scene regarding Wonder Girl. So rather than everything being mashed together it's just one thing that's really stretched out. The second of the only two things that Bendis knows how to do. The scene with Wonder Girl has some really cloying dialogue and forced humor natural to Bendis but it does set up a character thread okay enough. In any case, I find most of this decent relative to the writer. My only real concern is that this was clearly a cut scene from the original issue that they couldn't fit in because it ends abruptly. Like I said, not much happens in it outside of the Wonder Girl scene. So yeah, one thumb down, one thumb middle. And lastly, right before I forget, we end this off on a good note with the Dreaming number 6, which is the finale to the first arc. And I just want to say that I didn't understand much of it, but I know that I loved it. It was this tangible force of a read and it kind of almost swept me away. I kind of got lost in the momentum of the story being told. This has turned out to be an arc that I will definitely be rereading because I feel it's deserving of it. The two big standouts of this issue have to be getting our first fully realized look into Dora's mindset which comes across in this very barrier styled back and forth argument between her and her own narration. It's pretty charming and showcases a gripping amount of her character. The rest is definitely kept buoyant by Bill Quisavelli's amazing art. When I said I was almost worth the wait, I meant it literally. The art is brisk, beautiful, powerful. Each new set piece and scene is fantastically rendered and the final action packed act of this issue is intense, wild, chaotic, and majestic. It was a really fun ride and where I could keep up with the narrative, it pulled off really clever character plot turns, some which caught me off guard and I loved that. It might not have always been the best arc, no doubt but it's got so much character and individualism to it that I really felt like it was trying its best to earn and that was commendable. I have a lot of fun with this and I always remember Zeggy. May he rest in peace you blank soggy radical bastard. I love you. One thumb middle one thumb up.
Anyway, let's move on to listener questions. We have a few this week. Our first one comes from the ever great AkiCat, and their question is, who do I prefer, Neil Gaiman or Alan Moore? Well, this is a bit of a twofold question. They both wear two hats, as novelists and as comic writers. Now, Moore has only written the one novel, which I do have, but I haven't been able to make much headway through it. That's nothing on its own end. I just don't have the time. So Gaiman wins out when it comes to that. And Nancy Boys is kind of a masterpiece, and Good Omens with Terry Pratchett, is one. But in terms of comics, I have to go with more. A League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and Providence are amazing. The former vary intermittently, but each installment has some spark of greatness that makes it so fun to run through. Providence though, it's kind of a perfect horror comic. And of course, other series like Top 10, Supreme, and Bits of Promethea are all just ironclad. So yeah, one for one and one for the other. And you might say that I haven't mentioned any of the comics that Gaiman did, but while I enjoy aspects of like Sandman and I do like like a couple of the short stories that have been adapted to comics, they just don't really stick out to me that much. At least as much as something that I really do kind of place and regard as my favorites of all time. So thank you for the question, Eka Cat, and I hope I answered it to the fullest of your satisfaction. Next up, we have a question from Mitch Gosser, and their question is, what is my preferred class in a tabletop game, a la Pathfinder or D&D? Now this is a great question, and I'm fully for the fact that someone has picked up on the flexibility of question asking. My answer to this is Barbarian. I'm not that complex, and I feel like that class pretty much fulfills my basic needs when playing. It's honestly the same with anything. Video games, board games, even Monopoly. So yeah, Barbarian, and I hope that doesn't color your view of me that much, Mitch. Thank you for the question. It was really fun. Our last question comes from Sizazea, and I hope I said that right. And their question is, is there a creative team that would make you read a character that you don't usually like? I feel like it has to be, or at least it would be fun to say a character that I kind of despise. So I'm going to say America Chavez. Not really through any inherent fault of the character on their own, but that recent run was just so horrifyingly bad that it topped my list of things I never want to read or touch anything regarding that ever again. So the creative team? Warren Ellis. Not for any particular reason. It's just that if I saw a solicit that said Warren Ellis was writing a new America Chavez series, you're damn right that would get my attention immediately. I'd feel like I would have to read it just to see what the fuck would happen. Maybe it'd be fun in an Ultimate Fantastic Four kind of way. Overall, it's even just trippy to think about. So yeah, thank you for that question. I hope I answered it in a way that satisfied you. And thank you all for your questions this week. It really meant a lot to me. It really means a lot to have questions coming in and feedback and comments. It's honestly pretty amazing and I'm so humbled by it. And I'm humbled by anyone who has ever sent in a question, comment, or feedback. It means honestly the world and there wouldn't be a show without any of you. So thank you so much. And I just want to say that if you have any of your own comments, thoughts, or questions that you want to hear discussed on the show, you can always contact me on Twitter at TH underscore S-N-I-C-K-M-A-N and I want to give a shout out to the cover artist for the show at D-O-T-E-M-C-E-E go check them out they really deserve it anyway I think that's it for this week next week we have hopefully a whole slew of reviews especially for Doom Patrol I can't wait to see how that turns out yeah no have a great week and see you then